We are here to discuss uh, the menopause and the second half of a woman's life. Um, part of the reason I wanted to be on this panel is that I feel compelled to tell you that I still ovulate regularly every 24 days and I'm happy and also a bit surprised to not yet be menopausal myself. However, I, like all my friends of a similar age, I'm 47, um, I'm obsessed really with the menopause and with what happens and with the fact that we can discuss every most private biological aspect of our lives but people are still very very reluctant to tell you what actually happens which seems weird given that unlike pregnancy uh, the menopause and the withering is uh, an inevitability so i'm here because i wanted to hear from all of you and from the people on the panel about whether it really is a kind of loss of bloom that we tragically face or whether there is hope. Um, I will now introduce the panel. Over here is Catherine Whitehorn, um, icon and pioneer, whose uh, seminal Cooking in a Bedsitter has been in print for over 40 years. Um, Catherine has been writing columns since the 60s. Uh, she reclaimed in 1963 the use of the word slut to mean <laughs> slovenly. Um, and spoke, really articulated the realities of life for an entire generation. It was a life that involved uh, painting your stockings with ink when there was a your leg with ink when there was a ladder on your stockings rather than being um, necessarily all matchy-matchy with a hat and a handbag. And she is amazing. She still writes for The Observer and it's a delight to be in the same room as her. Um, here we have Jill, who um, worked in uh, finance uh, and advertising initially, um, then in the theatre, um, and then in 2011, I'm doing this from memory, you have to forgive me, in 2011 uh, wrote a book called The Second Half of Your Life, the, um, the, 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 the thingy of which was that <laughs> the, the second 50 years can be as good if not better, as the first 50 years. That book has now become um, a, f a physical thing. Um, Jill started a foundation, and um, there is now, as of October, a centre in North Kensington that makes it possible for people of 50 and over to flourish, men and women, not just women. And over here we have Angie Lamar, who needs no introduction, who is Britain's first lady of black comedy. I don't know that we need the black in there necessarily, but anyway. Um, and who is a producer, a writer, a comedian, is on TV, is on the radio, is fantastic. And who shall start? Shall you start? You shall start. Okay, I'll start. Hi, everyone. Oh, sorry, sorry, that. Um, you've all got a card on your seat for the uh, speech to text facility. If you find it useful, please fill in the card and leave it in a box on the way out. Hi everyone. Hello. Hi. Hello. It's really great to be here. Um, I have to say, when I was asked to come here to talk on the panel and they said menopause, something in me said, I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and then something in me said, yes, I do. And um, I will start with saying that um, growing up, I didn't think I'd get to 40. You know, when you think when I get old, um, I, if, if I live that long, and then suddenly I became that age that you think, okay, I'm here now. And I started looking at workshops and different things in my life and could see an age barrier. You know, when you start looking at workshops and it says 15 to 20, then it says 20 to 25, then you think, I'd love to go to that. And then it says 30 to 35 to 40. And then you stop seeing your age. Then you realize that you're no longer a part of society in one way. So when I got to 40, I wrote a play called 40 just to kind of let me deal with it. Yay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I really enjoyed getting it out of my system because they said life begins at 40. And as I've been going past 40 and going heading on to 50, I'm now realizing that my body was changing. And I started to sweat a lot. I started to get uncomfortable with myself. You know, I'd be driving in the car and I'd want the window open when the snow is falling at the same time. And I couldn't quite work out what was going on with my life. But what really kind of really brought it home to me was when my son um, gave me my granddaughter. And everybody kept saying to me, oh, you look like a great, great grandmother. And I couldn't hear the word grandmother. I couldn't understand I was a grandmother. And it got to about 45, 46, that I started to embrace who I am and the fact that I am actually getting older and I'm actually enjoying it. And it got to a point where I went, you know, I just got from Jamaica and I saw my mum who's still got menopause at 75. She's still sweating. 
really sweating and she sits there with the air conditioning on and my dad has the control. <laughs> so she's switching it off and he's switching it off because it's getting too cold for him. And I looked at her and I said, Mom, surely it's supposed to end by now. And she just said, I don't know, it just keeps going on, it, it doesn't stop. And it was at that point in my life I thought, I need to start understanding what is going on with my body, because my body is changing. There are times when I just wake up and I just think, I can't take no more. This thing in my head is too much, and I don't understand what's going on. But I was too scared to go to the doctors to talk about it, because that conversation doesn't seem to come across amongst women too often. You know, you don't sit down with a woman and say, oh, you look a bit older, can you tell me what I should do? <laughs> because nobody wants to own it publicly. And so to do this seminar is also for me as well, because I'm going through that stage where I'm looking at myself and embracing myself at the same time, but also wanting to find out exactly what is going on with my body and having to deal with it. So I'm also here on this side as well as on that side. But I do have to say that as I'm getting older, I'm starting to really enjoy my life because all the responsibilities that I had, you know, I've got three children and a granddaughter now and all the stuff that I used to have to do, I don't seem to want to do them anymore. Not that I don't care, I do feed my family, but I, <laughs> but I just don't have that responsibility of what am I, what, why am I here? I don't have to apologize anymore. I don't have to look in the mirror and say, oh my God, you're getting old. I'm glad I'm getting old. My dad said to me once that he was driving in a car and somebody pulled him, pulled him up and shouted at him and said, you're old. And he said, well, I got here. <laughs> so I'm here and I'm enjoying it. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Joel Shaw Ruddick. I wanted to ask, you and I would love a show of hands. How many in this room have had the conversation with their mother many, many years ago? Some of you less, many, some of you are young in here, but a lot of you are my age, and that's nice too. Um, how many of you had the conversation with your mother that about when you were going to get your period and that your body was going to change and you were going to go from a girl to a woman? Pretty much everyone, one would hope. Yeah, you, you probably need to, because you, your mother probably didn't want you to wake up one morning and freak out. Okay. Um, and how many of you here had a conversation, either with your mother or an aunt or an older person, about contraception, sex, and boys? Oh, boy, well, that's my daughter. She raised her hand. <laughs> I hope so, because otherwise you probably might have had babies way earlier than you wanted to. And I guess the next question is, how many of you, and I'm not very expecting very many of you to uh, raise your hands, how many of you have had the conversation about menopause with your mother? That is just fantastic. Okay. So for me, I uh, was 48 years old, and I didn't have a clue what was going on because I never had the menopause conversation with my mother. And at 48, um, menopause hadn't even crossed my mind, to be perfectly honest. And, um, and I was going through lots of the symptoms, typical symptoms like heart palpitations and things like that. Uh, depression, looking at a lettuce leaf and gaining weight. I mean, all those things that are typical of menopause. And I didn't have a clue what was going on. And so eventually my husband said, why don't you go see a doctor, which I did do. And he asked me a few basic questions. And he said, you know, when was the last time you got your period? And I, of course, was so happy not to have to be thinking about these things that I said I had no clue and, and on and on and on. But the fact of the matter is, is that I was virtually a postmenopausal woman and I knew that I was not the stupidest person in the room. And so I then realized that you know, at that moment, I needed to go to the library and go to the bookstore and buy some books on menopause, which I did do. And uh, overnight, I figured out very quickly what it, where I was in my menopausal journey. Um, and the next day, the doctor called and he said, um, I think I know what's wrong with you. And I said, oh, really? I said, am I perimenopausal, thinking that I was the smartest person now about menopause? And he said, uh, no. And I said, oh my God, I'm pregnant. And he said, no, actually, you're postmenopausal. There's not a trace of estrogen in your body. And over the next few months, I expect a lot of your symptoms to go away. So that was the beginning. And I thought, oh, wouldn't that be just so great to open up the dialogue about menopause? But then I went through menopause, and I realized that I was looking at the world in a slightly different way. And I thought, 
is there a physiological reason for this change? And so I then started to study the brain and I figured out something that I don't think that was talked about very much. But before I get there, first I want to give you just a two minute menopause masterclass. Does, ever, does anybody want that or does everybody think they understand what happens during menopause? Do, do, we, want to, do we want to have a short menopause masterclass? Okay, I'm going to be very, very quick. But okay. Um, so for many, many years, your body's doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing, and you know the progesterone's talking to the estrogen, and the estrogen's talking to the testosterone, and you every month you get a period, and you and you get affected by PMT because that's when your estrogen is rising and your progesterone is collapsing, and and so that's that little period where you're not really sure who you are anymore. But when you go through perimenopause, which um, is not exactly uh, you're not going to like this, guys. It's anywhere from 2 to 15 years. This is when your body starts changing. And what happens, there are three phases of menopause. The first phase is when you lose 100% of your progesterone. 100%. Now, progesterone is, I'm just going to just make sure that, because I didn't want to miss anything. It gives you your metabolism. It stabilizes your blood sugars to eliminate fat and excess fluid, which is why we all start to gain weight then, and we, don't, we can't figure out why. It regulates your thyroid, which regulates your energy. It encourages deep, restful sleep. This is when you start getting those 4 o'clock wake-up calls, and you're not really sure why you're waking up. Um, and it brings a sense of well-being. Um, and so when you lose your progesterone 100%, you sort of begin thinking that maybe you're starting in your own private movie of Alien or Stranger in a Strange Land, and, and you're not really sure who you are anymore. So this is all going on in phase one. What also happens during phase one is that you lose 80% of your testosterone. What does testosterone do? Testosterone does the same thing for you that it does for a man, except we just have a lot less of it. So testosterone builds muscle strength. It gives you confidence. It, um, it gives you your mojo, your sexual um, desire, and, um, and it gives us the energy to withstand, uh, withstand stress, and it also regulates cholesterol Can levels. Can I just say, the Thames is behind us. We could maybe just f line up on the balcony and jump into it. No, no, it, it gets point. better. <laughs> the news gets better. I just, wanna, I just need to get through this, because you know what? I figured that most of you here have not had the menopause conversation, and so I'm going to be very, very quick. And then the phase two is when we lose 99.2% of our estrogen. So estrogen is what makes us a woman, and, and estrogen is what makes us menstruate. And when we lose that estrogen, that's when we stop getting our periods. It also, um, it also regulates your body heat. This is when you know that you're in the heat of menopause, right? Because you walk down the street and all of a sudden you get a surge and you feel like you can light up all of London. That's, that's, um, that's all part of it. Uh, skin elasticity and, and then um, the lubrication issue, which um, I'm sh really sure that your guys are going to ask me about later, so I won't get in there. But it, you know, the lubrication issue is a big issue. And also, you know, who really wants to feel like they're losing their virginity every time they have sex? I mean, it's just not a lot of fun. So, um, and then you lose your balance and coordination and you have, um, and it also goes with your depression and anxiety. And that is the menopause masterclass. When that is all over and you don't get your period for 12 months, you then and forevermore become a postmenopausal woman. Now remember that. You can have hot flashes, you can do whatever you want to do, but once you anniversary your period, you're a postmenopausal woman. Now why did I write a book about successful aging if that's the story? Here's the story, and this is what you all have to remember. Mother Nature actually had a reason, and, they, and, and she actually loves women. Because what happens to the brain after menopause is amazing. So you lose your progesterone, all of it, you lose 80% of your testosterone, and you lose basically all of your estrogen. You can do the math. What are you left with? Testosterone. What does testosterone do for men? It makes you confident. It makes you define yourself outside the home. It gives you the will to take on new challenges and have the confidence to do that. That's what happens to the postmenopausal woman. And when I figured that out, I could then write a book about successful aging, and it's called The Second Half of Your Life. Now, what I did to write that book was I interviewed 150 women, I interviewed neuroendocrinologists, I interviewed scientists, I did all of that. And I found out that there were five things that the happiest women who, who age successfully do, and I call them my five a day, and I'm gonna tell you what they are. Have a passion, that's things that you do for yourself. Have a purpose, have a purpose greater than yourself. Do something for somebody else. Exercise eat nutritionally, and stay connected to family, friends, and your community. They're simple, but if you do it, 
I can promise you that you will have a very good second half of your life. So when I, when I um, did my book launch and I realized that I was going to sell more than five copies, I decided that I would start a foundation, which I did, called the Second Half of Your Life Foundation. And from there, um, I built a center in an NHS facility called St. Charles, and it's to bring those five a day to life. And we opened our doors on October 29th. We have 690 members. We have over 50 hours of activities a week. And I really hope that when you leave here, you'll look it up. It's um, on my website, www.thesecondhalfcenter.com, and come and rediscover the joys of the second half of your life. Being a postmenopausal woman is transformational, and they call it the change for a reason, and the change is good. Catherine? Well, I feel myself in something of a difficulty because I didn't quite realize the extent to which this was going to be focused on post-menstrual because I thought it was just how can we manage to grow old, which I know... Oh, that too, that too, that that absolutely applies. What? I'm allowed to do that good. But (laughs) while we're at it, I have to say that there are, as probably most people in the room know, things that you can do to not actually go on having so many of the physical effects and you do not be fobbed off with anything that's done taken from the urine of pregnant mares which is not only (laughs) disgusting but actually keeps on giving you a bleed so it's not worth doing and americans don't know about the one which is called livial if you get it privately and tibalone if you get it on the national health which is made by a company in Cambridge and you don't get a bleed and if you have had a broken shoulder and a broken wrist and a broken ankle it is your bone man who says couldn't you get some HRT which I am now con- con- commanded to be on so setting that aside can go on and talk about being old which I am rather more accustomed to considering um, I think that several things. I'm rather slightly sorry that there are a few men in the room because I was about to cheer everybody up by saying how much better at old age we are than they are. (laughs) Um, And in in terms of uh, the development of the human creature, why on earth could women go on living so long after they have stopped being able to bear children and how could it be that the ability to go on living after you can reproduce has actually had an effect since um, obviously it can't be passed on to a child because the point is that they've stopped having them and the answer apparently is that the children of people who had gone on living longer did better because their mothers helped them bring the kids up Mm -hmm. and I think if you go to a respectable Darwinian source, you'll find I'm not actually talking through my hat. However, I can now start talking to my through my hat and say, well, how is it? How can we actually cope with the fact that we're not young anymore, which is rather different. And I think that what we've come to realise recently, because people are living longer, because the medicine's better, that it's not just a question of your your child you're young, you're mature, you're old. It's not like that. There's an extra age because you were, let's say you're up to 15 or 20 when you're getting ready for life. Then you've got wherever you get to the point where you're about to retire. And then you're supposed to be old, which puts into the same category somebody quite bright retiring at 65 with somebody in a care home at the end of their 90s, which is ridiculous. And in fact, um, several people, um, including the woman who's just stopped being head of Saga, she use, she comes from the world of insurance so she use, and banking, so she calls it the bonus years, but I come from a more more academic background and I call it the emeritus years, because in academia, it gets to a point where the hair professor is still doing jolly good work, but they'd rather have a younger person to run the department. And the extent to which people are doing interesting things and being role models and having fun after what is technically retiring age. And the Women's Voluntary Service, which one thinks of as just sort of 
doling out bowls of porridge to elderly pe- people in hovels, but that's not so. They did a very good series a couple of years ago. One was to prove how much older people put into the economy, where everybody's talking as if we're totally a drag on it, which we're not. Um, and the other, we all, several of us, were summoned to name the number of people that you never think of as being old, like Delia or Ralph Fiennes. Or you may have your problems with Ken Livingstone, but you don't think of the poor old guy, he's an oldie. And if you actually go through the people that you've heard of, read by the papers, the astonishing numbers of them are past what would once have been considered retiring age. And I'm not sure that having such a rigid view of that is all that unusual in the history of the world because when jobs were hereditary, you kept going as long as you could and the people who ran Europe after the war were most of them people who were pretty elderly, mostly men, but never mind. The the idea that you stop as soon as you cease to be young is the one that is absolutely taking a battering. And I think everybody in this room would agree with me about that. Um, I think that old people do have problems. Maybe they don't have all the same problems if people are coming to a thing like this. They're not suffering one of the major problems in Britain of the elderly, which is social isolation. And all the major charities have started trying to do things about that. Um, It's made worse by the fact that (coughs) the whole idea of what a family should be doing has changed. I'm agony art for saga, as you said, and I get gloomy letters from people who want to see far more of their daughters or their sons or their grandchildren than they actually can. I also, I won't go on about this now, but I can tell you that there is an abominable, lousy daughter-in-law who is just as bad as the awful mother-in-law. Um, they do terrible things. They sort of wrote no notes saying that they're not to come unless they phone first and say it's all right, or they won't let the grandmother see the children and so on. And the idea that the family will take care of you, as far as Britain is concerned, Mm -hmm. actually doesn't work anymore. Uh, Quite often, people who would like to be very close to their older parents can't be. They're working in a different place, or the mother is uh, coping with children, where the grandmother may well help, but also has a job. And I get sad letters from people. They don't seem to realise that I, that I really need them to, to ring me up once a week. And you think, well, where could you do that? That's not so bad. But the whole pattern of the idea that the family takes care of everything and that you expect to take care of your children and that they will take you in their old age doesn't actually work much anymore. You have to make some other arrangement for your old age. And for an awful lot of us, the best thing you can do is to go on working in some way, not necessarily in the same way, not necessarily a paid job where you have to get in there at nine in the morning uh, unless the tubes are broken down again, Um, but doing something. The number of people who say, well, we found that we can do voluntary work and it's extremely useful and good. And the voluntary work, yes, they're helping the charity, but they're helping themselves much more. Something like Youth 3 Age is absolutely marvellous. And one of the things that is really a difficulty in our society that has to be somehow solved is the fact that there are too, far too few places anymore where you meet automatically with other people your own age to have spend time with and so on. You, don't, you can't meet at the post office anymore. They've shut it. Um, you don't meet at church anymore because not so many people go to church. And um, this, uh, the number of places where traditionally women always met each other at the workplace, it was where you were doing the washing or you were doing it, and when the Pope said that he thought that the uh, the washing machine had done more for women than the contraception, the previous Pope, I say, well, he had, probably hadn't tried either of them, but um, <laughs> he was not necessarily right because 
a woman isn't necessarily better stuck alone in a kitchen with a washing machine than going down to the watering place or the wo- or the wash house, get- gossiping away with all her friends. And it's not nonsense that all the major charities are treating social isolation rather than um, ability not n- inability to find the money for things as their major concern. Can and I quickly interrupt you and ask you if you think the internet is helpful to older people in, in terms of social isolation and in terms of yes, having conversations a, that aren't necessarily up physical? Up a bit, Lord Copper. This is another thing which needs a lot of attention. I'm not saying you want to dismiss it. But when I say that, I couldn't for, do my copy. And I'm 85 and I've been working at it with a computer for five years. I couldn't send my copy into the observer because the broadband that my son had fixed doing something, it wasn't doing rubbish. I had to go to next door. Could they do it this? Yes, they might. I finally phoned it in. The idea that the internet will solve everything, mm. it won't solve it for us. Um, I rather hope it won't solve it for the next lot too, so that they have the same difficulties we have when everything's changed by the time they're 55. Um, that's just being mean about it. But um, the Japanese have got mechanical dolls to substitute for babies. Mm. They, uh, the idea that you can do everything on the net. You've got 100 friends on Facebook, mm. and who do, you, who do you share a drink with in the evening? Mm. Yes, I think that there is a great difficulty about this because I think the kids coming up will obviously be much better at this than people who have had to learn it in later life. I'm sure nine-tenths of the people in this room are better at it than I am, which isn't difficult. Um, But the idea that doing things without human contact is not actually a particularly good idea for human happiness. Uh, This is just uh, something that I argue, argue from time to time. But I think what we can say is that there are ways in which things are much better for us than they've been for our predecessors. Um, for one thing, we're all a whole lot healthier. Uh, I know we, you know things wrong. Uh, so we must keep our GPs because almost everybody of retiring age has something wrong with them and it takes somebody who knows who you are to know whether this time it's serious. But the, th- the way we live longer... I went to a conference in New Orleans the year before Katrina, and the person doing a speech after me was talking about cancer. This was a conference for achieving women, so I don't think there would have been anybody under 30. But she said, put up your hands if you have had cancer, and two-thirds of the room put their hand up. Um, I've had it. I didn't tell Flea Street about it. They'd have made me write about cancer. But the extent to which the ills that which we used to suffer from can be cured anymore is something that gives us enormous opportunities and I think we ought to oh god is that going up there I didn't realise um, and I th- well I th- I'll finish by saying this I think that most of the people who are now older have been probably well brought up and maybe one of the things we have to learn is to take life on our own terms and not necessarily follow all the rules all the time and i had a marvelous example of this about 10 days ago i had had a particularly bruising session at the physiotherapist and went into the raw society medicine which i belong to and put a shot in my coffee at half past 11. and i thought i was as bad you know it's at 12 you know you're supposed to wait the, over the one and next door to me were a couple um who were having a glass of wine each at the same time and i said i'm so need to say that and the man delivered a remark which has become my motto i'm thinking of doing it in poker work he said the closer to the grave you get the less the rules apply <laughs> We can um, go in, in, in any number of directions from there, but the isolation thing seems to me quite central to all of it. You're too much of a spring chicken, presumably, to feel... I mean, do you feel other? Do you feel that you're kind of on the outside looking in a bit, saying, let me in, or not yet? Well, I think for myself, I've, I've always felt um, on the outside looking in, but I've kind of like... I got a dog um, three years ago, 
And um, every morning I walk my dog and every evening and I met a, a new community. And it just surprised me that the people that I had met in the park, I wouldn't ordinarily go up to and speak yeah. to. And I've become such close friends. And they're different ages, different cultures. And it kind of reminded me of what I was missing out on mm. in life because mm. we are told how we're supposed to be, how we're supposed to, and what groups we're supposed yeah, to fit in. Board. And yeah. now that we want to get out and grow up and meet everybody, yeah. you don't know how to go yeah. out and do that. Yeah. And I think when you speak about the social networks, and you know, I, I know how to use the social networks now because I got disappointed with it for quite a long mm. time because I'd be looking at people's yeah. tweets and looking at their Facebook and thinking, oh, wow, you didn't invite me to that event that you've, you're talking about. Or there's a picture of somebody you think, well, well, why didn't you tell me? And I start making up their story and putting it in my head. And then one day I said, I don't actually care about what you're thinking, but I would like to talk. Mm. So now I'm actively going out to meet people, actively going out to groups. And you know when you see those little adverts in the park that say coffee mornings and what? I'd go and sit and make Fantastic. friends, yeah. and I wouldn't order to, you know, do that. And I think as I'm getting older, you think that's absolutely a function of age. It's absolutely well. I think so because I do you think, think it's I was a too busy. Of stopping caring of that. Whoops, of that oh yes, absolutely. Thing. Do you think there is a part of you that the day comes I, that says, "I sod it, I'm just going to do." The day I stopped doing. caring, I was sick. I had flu on the brain for a year, and I had to go to have lumbar punctures like every week throughout my pregnancy. I nearly died, and lost the vision on my right side, and it was at the end. And I just realised I've got to live. I've really got to do everything now because I can't afford to get to that place. I've buried a lot of friends, mm. you know, of cancer. I've buried them of heart attacks and they're my age. Mm. And it's that point when you look at life and you think, I'm going to do all the things I really want to do, but not in a panic. Mm. You know, I don't want to really draw. I don't want to make pottery. I don't mm. want to do that. Mm. But I'm, I, I might try, but I don't want to try and do things that I don't necessarily need yeah. to do. I want to be around people. So when you were speaking about families and being around communities, I'm finding that I'm drawing more to my family. My parents, I'm looking to be in Jamaica in the next two years because Your are in Jamaica. they live in Jamaica. And I saw my parents the other day and I looked at them, I thought, I got to get back to look after mm. you. And I've got to work out how I'm going to do that. And they've become very important. My mm. friends have become... And, and my friends, have, they've got smaller the groups mm. because you test friends, don't yeah. you? And when you're going through that challenging time, you think, well, I was there for you and you're not here for me. Mm. And it's not that you tick them off. They naturally pull away yeah. from you and you're left with who you are supposed to be. Call, yeah. yeah, I found yeah. that. When, um, when I was setting up my foundation, it was very interesting because I went to the Charities Commission and I said... Um, I believe that social isolation affects all socioeconomic backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, 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 no. If you want to be a charity, you can only be for poor people. And I, and I went through this long thing where, you know, and, and I think all of us know this, that social isolation, is, it's like cancer. It's indiscriminate. It doesn't care who you are. It can creep up on you in a way, and then all of a sudden you're isolated and you're alone. And that's really why, um, and so they bought that. They, they eventually bought into it. And then in exchange for that, um, I wanted to, because my book was just for women, I just wanted to have a place for women. And they went, no, no, no. Men are just as isolated as women in the second half of their life. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. Okay, let's do men and women. And so we horse traded. And, and now I'm hoping for my first marriage at the second half center, but we're not there yet. But I, but, I, but I do think that this whole idea about the internet is very important because I do think that people need to be able to communicate um, in 21st century ways, in the same way that we're tackling, you know, where isolation and, and, and this exploding older population is a 21st century problem, it needs to be attacked with 21st century solutions. And I think it is giving people the skills to go back to work because, you know, if you believe everything that's coming out now, you're going to live to 100 and that's going to be just average. And so, you know, if you're thinking about giving money away, don't because you're going to need it. But but the other thing is, is that, you know, you do need to know how to, um, how to Facebook and, and do those things. And you do need to know how to do Excel. And you do need to know how to get on and do email. And those are, those are the realities. And if, and if you are going to go back to work, because I do think that we're all going to live longer and we are going to need the money, that you do need those skills. And, and you're going to need to learn those skills to feel empowered to go back to work and, and do those things. There's also, it seems to me, quite a plausible 19th century solution, which is to provide, as Catherine was saying, public spaces 
in which older people could meet. I mean, it wouldn't cost a fortune, would it? Mm. If you look at the number of disused pubs that were around and so on, of just making places where older people can come together and chat and drink and eat cheese sandwiches and mill about and do whatever Mm. they want to do. It's the the thing of everybody being so atomised that's so supremely unhelpful, it seems. And and there's there's a lot of it. And when, you know, I admit that obviously people can't because they're old... Uh, simply ignore the whole possibilities of the net. But I think one of the things that trouble is that it's assumed that everybody knows how to do it. Mm. And my, uh, I'm hoping somebody here might actually pick this up and run with it. The, you, there w- was, and indeed still is, a thing called Universal Aunts, which used to take oh, children yes, to the sorry, stations. Yeah. And they still exist, and they still send round people. Um, I mean, w- we've had... Oh, I had an aunt who needed you know, two or three weeks, they they, they still exist. What we need now, and I realise I may have to change the name of this in this company, I've been saying what we need is universal sons, people who will come round and do the things Mm. that they have told you, oh, you just do this, 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 and then they're out the door, Mm. come round and fix your flaming Mm. computer, um, (laughs) actually reach up to these. Could, Could you and I actually change those bulbs easily? Not, um, not if they've got a clippy bit in them. I'm b- baffled by the clippy and bits. Mind, <laughs> mind you, this question of getting computer help, I had some put through the door, showed a very sensible, nice-looking woman. Uh, I thought, well, that would be all right. Um, and so I rang up and said, look, I have this terrible problem. What actually came round was a rather elderly Indian gentleman. And he did what it was. But I think that the whole question of the supporting of... of mm internet presence is if anybody's looking for something to add to their portfolio mm. I could give you my address and I'll need you any time <laughs> <laughs> very good note to conclude on that um, so I would like to thank you all very much for coming this little thing please fill in and um, yeah have a nice Sunday thank you